And we're live! Hey everybody, this is Mike McLean, and we're here at the Coffin Comics Con Online. And I'm here with um, two of Coffin Comics' most... Um, most uh, deadly coolest. Deadly coolest. <laughs> most, <laughs> most deadly, most talented, many, many, many adverbs there. Our creators, Monty Moore and Mike DeBalfo. And I'd like to, before we start our, our Q&A session here, it's the, the panel is the art of the cover and what makes a, a cover arts piece um, just amazing. Um, and before we start our presentation, I'd like to say to the people online, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the comments and we'll try to get to them along, uh, some, somewhere along the way, way in our discussion. Okay, so Without further ado, we have Monty Moore and Mike Balfo. First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself for some of the people that may not know. Monty, why don't you go first? A little bit about your career, your background. Uh, I've almost been in the industry for 30 years. I started in 1993. I self-published a comic with some buddies, and then within a few years, I started doing small, independent uh, covers for, as a freelancer. So one of my first was Helena, back in the sort of bad girl days of uh, comics and things like that, and then kind of slowly built a career from there. And then I would say for about 10 years, I wasn't so active in comics, and most of the work I was getting hired for was in gaming. So I worked on Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, uh, mostly games. So I would go to shows like Gen Con and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, over the last couple of years, especially painted covers and things like that have also had a little bit of a resurgence because for a while they were very sort of out. And digital coloring, you know, was the good majority of the market. Now we found a nice balance, I think, between that. And so you see some of the painted artists, Lucio Perillo, myself, who are getting a little bit more work, which is great. Um, and I started working again with Brian in 2014 uh, when I was like, hey, I, a little, you know, rumor heard that that Lady Death was coming back under Brian's helm, and I had done uh, three covers for him at the very tail end of the chaos era. So I had done two chastity cover, two purgatory covers on a chastity cover. So didn't get to be a part of that for too long. Uh, and so uh, ever since 2014, and provided, you know, maybe on the low end, like two covers in a year, and maybe on the high end, maybe five in a year. So I think since 2014, there's maybe 30 to 40 covers total uh, in that time frame. Amazing. And Mike, how about yourself? Uh, I'm trying to be Monty Michael Moore. <laughs> we all are. Uh, I'm trying to be him, so. Uh, no, I, 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 I've been in since 2009. I started with Zenitsco Entertainment in 2009. Um, and, you know, things started to snowball out. There's mostly doing covers. I, broke, I never did anything published and broken as a cover artist through Zenitsco in 2009, and that's kind of what my career path has followed since then. After that, I uh, worked with Aspen Comics for two and a half years, I think, doing interiors on Soulfire, Volume 4, and also covers for a bunch of their other series. And after that, that's when like, the, the floodgates really opened up. And uh, Well, in between those two, I should say, I started working with Brian, and then the floodgates opened up, and I started working with other companies. And, uh, mostly comic books and pinups covers is what I do, because I like drawing groups. So, yeah. I can remember when I saw his first art, I was like, who the hell is this guy? Who's this punk? There's a new turd, there's a new sheriff in town. I was like, shit, the competition's getting Well, I, that's how I feel about it, too. I'm watching all these new kids coming in now, because I'm, 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 well, I'm 11 years in. Right, yeah. And uh, I'm watching these new kids come in, and I'm like, oh my god. Like, Jay Ennis Leto, I think is his name. Yeah. 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 That guy's amazing. Yeah. He's working at Santa's Gope Marvel, he's all over the place. And, yeah. How do I, you know, match that guy? Yeah, so, it makes you bring your A game, and as a cover artist yeah. and things like that, you we always pay attention to yes. other artists that are out there. You know, you may be putting a little folder that says badass stuff that I, you know, want to take inspiration from, yeah. and it helps you up your game, you know, or maybe gives you an idea later on of that was really clever. How do I put my own spin on that, right? Because we're always trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Totally. So to get kind of a behind the scenes uh, look at making cover, can you talk about the process of um, from either getting hired to do a specific cover, or do you get do you, are you inspired to draw an image and then present it to the publisher? What let me give me a, a bird's eye view of your process of, of, of from the idea to the finished product of the cover. What's, yeah, what's the <laughs> uh, Well, I would say there's probably two or three different routes. You have the 
you can do whatever you want. Here's the character. Have fun. And I think oftentimes we get that for him with uh, Lady Death. He says, you know, I would like a cover with, and maybe with this theme, it's St. Patrick's Day, it's snow or whatever. And that's the total freedom, and here's a sketch, and it might be in the wrong direction. It might go, hey, love it, just go ahead and draw it up, and you're good to go. And that's the, the absolute easiest. And you have in the middle, which is, here's these three criteria it needs to be. So if I'm doing the Seasons of the Abyss Art Nouveau cover, first I'm going out and getting some inspiration from Alphonse Mucha and other people who, you know, the sort of greats of Art Nouveau. And then I might put that reference aside and then work on the concept. And here's the ingredients it needs to have. So this week I was kind of pinging Brian and I was like, well, what are we going to do for spring? Like this is the last cover of the series. And I was kind of scratching my head. I'm like what do I include that's spring that's different? And so for those who saw the reveal earlier, I decided to have a giant bear next to her instead of like a dire wolf or something like that. Because I told Brian, I was like, well, you know, bears come out of hibernation, like they're asleep all winter. So what if we do this, you know, war bear kind of thing coming out? So I would ping Brian and say, uh, you know, do you want it to have armor and a harness and things like that? And I like getting that feedback from him because it gives me direction. Because he, he can visualize, he says, no, I want it to be more natural, right? It's spring. It's not a, we're going into war. It's, it's kind of more new beginning and so he said not just a just a badass bear you know natural not a bunch of hoo-ha on it so under her control and so uh but i might have one or two other questions but he doesn't say the bear is doing x y and z and it needs to look like this and it has to be a kodiak and you know some people just go crazy and they love wearing the art director hat mm -hmm. and a good portion of them have no no business wearing the art director hat and yeah. you get so constrained that it's so art directed to death by the time it's done there have been a few pieces that i have done not for coffin but for other customers and it is so stale yeah. by the time it's done because they, well the hand needs to get moved here and the face needs to do this and what you start out with which is mary very maybe a very flowing character that has great s shapes and things like this and by the time it's done they've sort of frankensteined it into this thing and I've even had a couple of customers at the end say, well, I don't like that. You know, what's happened here? And, I, and you want to say, you should have just let me, when I told you that the reason of her head shouldn't be up and the wrist shouldn't be like that is you've sewn it all together and now it doesn't look natural. Yeah, you got it your own way. Yeah. You know, as a yeah. director. Right. And so I do pretty tight prelims and a lot of people have seen some of the prelims that I do. And the secondary reason for that is as original art and as people who make a living selling originals, um, those originals have value to me as part of my income. And then the secondary part is also gives people buy original art that's less expensive than the sort of, we'll call it the big time original painting that might be um, unaffordable for some folks. Uh, and so all along the way, I'm always thinking of the process. I'm always thinking of the fans and the client. Me too, Mike. I second like everything he just said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything, everything from like you were saying about uh, you know concept up to the selling the original art, trying to make different tiers for different people who can afford different things. Like, mm -hmm. I try to think about that too. Um, the only thing I think that that's the most different is I'm so the way I work. I feel like I'm more secluded than most other artists. Like I sit down and I start doing concepts and thumbnails, and it's so rare that I actually have an open dialogue with the editor or art director that I'm with at the time, kind of like you were saying, you know, saying, hey, what about this and what about that? I don't know why I don't do that. And there's often times where I feel like I should. Mm. Um, but a lot of times I, I sit down, I put some music on, I start listening to music, I just stare in his face. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I do, and I start thinking of things, and I'll just you know start moving my pencil around. And the the first four or five, say, thumbnail poses will be just be chicken scratch, you know, warm-ups. And I'll keep doing those, and eventually they start evolving into an actual concept. Um, for something because like you said a lot of times a lot of times i'm at the point where the editor will say do whatever you want have fun with it most people will do that every once in a while they'll come in and say you know like like we'll say Murat, for example we did a um a naughty nice cover recently where he goes uh naughty nice cover your only concept is teddy bears and i was like all right that's cool so you know we just did a naughty nice with like teddy bears mm -hmm. like a lot of freedom yeah there's a lot of freedom and almost to a point like I'm saying, I, I should get into the habit of doing like what you're saying, open more dialogue and be more back and forth with uh, with the team. 
because sometimes I feel like my concepts do get stifled because I am, I guess, get caught in my own head. Like I said, it's nothing selfish and it's nothing stubborn about it. Um, I just I get in rhythm and I go for it, you know. And sometimes it holds me back because I'll, I'll shoot over four or five different thumbs or layouts to an editor, and he's like, I don't like any of these. You know, try it again. Pretty and pretty rare like, though, I bet. <laughs> I know it would happen more often than you think. Uh, and I don't mind because they're they're, they're small. You know, they're maybe right. Two inches tall. They're thumb, legit thumbnails, and I will That's tell you, there, are, there's yeah. not many people who do thumbnails. Even myself, I don't do as yeah. many thumbnails. I, but the reason why I, I reached out to Brian was you. Some of it's just driven by the fear of not wanting to go in the wrong direction. Yeah. So what happened on the spring one that I just mentioned that ended up being a totally different figure was I had drawn the background and all that sort of stuff, and so I sent it was already kind of on the direction. It was going to be the actual pretty detailed prelim. And I hadn't consulted him on ideas. And so I had her with uh, an umbrella over the shoulder. And I was like, springtime, it's getting, you know, there's going to maybe be some rain, and this is like perfect. And then he wrote back and said, you know what? We actually have some pieces coming out that have umbrellas. Now. <laughs> and so I was like, well, how in the hell would I know that? And so I said, you know, do you have any other suggestions? And I had done kind of a side, almost a little bit of a butt shot. When you do that kind of profile, you get a little bit of the side of the brass. Of course, you get the backside. And he said, you know, let's go back to a forward front facing figure coming out at you. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. He said, that's usually what engages people the best. Rather than the side view is less engaged to the viewer. Right, because she's you know kind of doing this or going away from you, whereas walking towards you, like we saw the success of the fans like the winter solstice piece of the of that series, and she's literally just walking towards you with weapons in hand with this badass Art Nouveau background. And it's like, okay, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Keep the background. So I played up all the spring elements. So I added tons of foliage and vines coming up all around it. Ch had to erase the whole figure and then change it to a front facing. And then I was like, well, what about a bear? And so once I redid it, that's an example of Brian's art direction creating a much better piece. So I'm looking at it as an artist going, man, I'm glad I changed that direction. Because yeah, right. it's pretty badass. But had he just said, hey, I don't want to hurt Monty's feelings. And you know, he's already spent a bunch of time on this. But he said, yeah, yeah, no, let's not do umbrella. Let's change your facing for it. He didn't have a problem with that. And he knows what is going to be more successful. And a cover, and especially as a piece that's also going to be offered as a fine art print, which is a more expensive item, it's got to be successful, right? You don't want to pay for an artist or uh, to, to not have a successful piece. And then our ego can take a hit too. If you go, man, how was that last cover, that last print? And they're like, you know, we, we have a bunch of copies if you want to buy some. <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, when it's original art, you have a hard time selling the original art. Yeah. You know, you yeah. Sell yeah. Sometimes you're like, why do I still have this? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Put it in a bargain bin of art, original art. There's no such thing as bargain bin. No? I do bargain bin. <laughs> yeah, I do bargain bin. Here's what you have, to, you have to flip that a little bit. And you have to say, you know, every day that a piece of original art is available is there's a chance that tomorrow it won't be available. So the Mona Lisa is much more valuable today than it was 400 years ago, even though it's not for sale. So you have to say original art, you know, hey, the longer I have it, it doesn't mean I'm at a discount. It means the more it's part of the Mike DeBalto archive okay. 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 early. I'm glad I talked to you, you about this. You got to bring it up. Again, it's cool. You guys are watching this happen. You're like, this may be 400 bucks today, but... I hate to say it, but like six months, it's going to be 500, and then seven months, it's going to be 800, so better get it now. <laughs> no, that, that's great advice, actually. We're kind of taking over the live stream, but, but like, you know, it's cool like Mike DeBelco and have to sell stuff. It's marketing. But, it's part no, of no, marketing. Sense. I've, never thought of it. I've never thought of it that way. Like, I get sick of looking at it. Like I said, I'm like, I'm like why do I still have this thing? Get it out of here. Yeah, it's 100 bucks now. I'm just telling myself this. I don't know if it actually works. But it makes sense. I don't know. I, I, I can run with that and see what happens. So I, I heard a couple things. I heard ingredients. I heard this piece is successful. Taking that in mind, what is the job of a good piece of cover art? What's what's the job of a cover art? Sell the book. In, in hand. So before comics and me coming to this, my job, because I've done a, a number, probably 10 to 20 novel covers back in the day, and fantasy, science fiction, things like that. And the job of the cover artist is to, in that sense, is to get the people who went into the bookstore at the time, pick up the book, turn it over, 
then it's the job of the writer, right? Because I got it in their hand. And if you read that inside dust jacket or the back cover and it doesn't intrigue you, you're like, eh, next, yeah. right? But to get it off the shelf, right? To go into any bookstore 20 years ago before everybody slapping Photoshop, you know, even your romance, the, the, the best artists and illustrators in the, in the industry were book cover artists. Doesn't matter if it was Frank McCarthy, Boris Vallejo, Frank Rosetta, their job was to sell books. So our job is exactly the same today uh, only there's a really collectible nature to it, right? So back then there wasn't variant covers. You're like, hey, this is the cover to the Tolkien's Fellowship of the Ring. This is the cover to Sword of Sharon. And everybody kind of knew it and knew artists like Hildebrandt, stuff like that. They, you know, that's how they made their name for themselves. But the way I look at it is, is the job one is to get it in their hands or in today's market, it's to get it in their collection. Right. Because a lot of these books we know will never be read, especially if you have multiple copies. So if we come out with the same book, or Mike's doing a cover for uh, a new one coming out, or my local hero book, or something like that, somebody might say, I want all four, I'm a completist, and they need all that. Or they might just collect their favorite artist. And the reason to have that is, even though I can do my own art, I also want to tap into Mike's fan base. And there's also, and I learned that really from Brian. And so I, all the artists that I'm working with on my project are actually all Coffin Comics Lady Death artists who I've liked and become friends with. And to say, how smart is this to capitalize on their fan base, my fan base, and combine it? The cross marketing. Yeah. Really yeah. Because there'll be people who are like, yeah, I'm not really into Monty's work. It's more, you know, maybe more painterly or, you know, more realistic. And they like a more comic, I call it the mainstream sort of comic style of today, which is your very hip you know, sort of luscious. And, you know, so that's what I love too. It's just, you know, you, you want to capitalize on that and offer different things. Because yeah. what, what, what appeals to one person might not appeal to somebody else. Are there any, are there any ingredients that go across the board that you think make a good cover, no matter what art style, um, what the artist style is, are there ingredients to a cover that make it successful in grabbing that person's attention? And pulling it off the shelf or I, pulling it offline for I most of our say readers. There's a formula or anything like that. I'm, um, I'm I mean, there's poses too, but not anymore. There's poses in certain compositions you can do that are like, that will sell, you know, as long as it's drawn well. Um, but you don't want to do that every time. Right. You know. And, and the thing is, I've seen successful pieces that are a, a floating head, a really nice head sketch. So, what, you know, what if it's the Joker or it's Lady Death? And it just intrigues people, whereas. If you have a traditional art background like me and you're saying, well, I'm designing composition to have the rule of thirds and I want yeah. a dynamic right, right angle and I want to put this here and I need to have complementary colors. A lot of that stuff's kind of out the window, I think, yep. these days exactly. uh, because uh, you can break a lot of those rules and be highly successful. And, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen a single cover or anything in the hall here at Coffin Comics that I don't think was successful. And my style and his style and Dan Mendoza's style and Yo-Yo's style are all extremely different. And so that's yeah. when you get all these different uh, fans and flavors of everybody. It's like ice cream. You know, chocolate's pretty good, but so is strawberry. And also, <laughs> also between different artists and different styles, there's different rules that can come into play. Like someone like Dan Mendoza has such an exaggerated style. Mm -hmm. He can get away with a lot more... Let's say distortion, volume. volume. Yeah, right. <laughs> to put it lightly, volume. But in certain ways that he composes characters, you know, to such an extremity beyond what you and I can pull off with our styles. It would probably look you pretty know. silly on. It would, right? Those yeah. backs broken. You know? Yeah. But on Dan's style, it works because it's already so exaggerated consistently throughout the entire figure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's like yes, yeah, like the rules that work for Dan might not necessarily work for you or me on this a cover for the same series. Yeah, I remember when I started doing more work in comics, I had a problem with the kind of more exaggerated figure, the length of it, and especially in the sort of mid to late 90s, when the figures got really, really long, right? J. Scott Campbell yeah, comes along, right. um, uh, Randy Queen, who was doing Dark Child, and these figures seemed like they were 11, 12 heads high, and it was like legs to here, yeah. you know, and then a little torso in this little head, and then you also had the, I call it the big feet era of the early 90s, like Joe Maggerera and yeah. stuff like that. And they were able to pull off this really unique style. And for a long time, the strangest thing is like the feet were emphasized. Mm -hmm. And they were gigantic, but they were also really cool styles. Like 
uh, Deity was one of the titles that you know really played into that that kind of style, and so you, you just see that in in comics, and there there seems to be ebbs and flows of what's popular. Yeah, when I, when I first discovered Tony Daniel, he was on a book called The Tenth, and he was drawing in that manga Joe Mad style, mm -hmm. and then I kind of fell off him for a little while, and then picked up whatever issue of Batman, and Tony Daniel drew it. I was like, it was like Jim Lee drew this. Right. It was the same guy. Like you're saying, ebbs and flow. Yeah. He's, you know, he was working that to his advantage, following the trend. Yeah, and I kind of do that at times too. It's and, smart. and even in the um, seasons of the Abyss that I'm doing now, I'm doing Art Nouveau kind of backgrounds, but I'm really doing the comics figures, kind of more like a Campbell, the Balfo, Mark Brooks, you know, with Monty Moore mixed in, longer figures, um, thin and athletic, you know, not muscular, not you know, realistic kind of proportions, and it works well with that look because Art Nouveau is very graceful yeah. and it's very long. So it, it would not be, it would not behoove the art piece to say, oh, I'm going to do a totally realistic figure that's, you know, a short five and a half foot tall lady death. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any like mistakes that you would see from the novices coming into the field. What's what's a what's a pitfall of, of doing a piece of cover art that, that maybe new artists out there can avoid? Anatomy. anatomy. Bad anatomy. bad anatomy. Yeah, study your anatomy. Oh, well, so we have a we have a guest to walk in. There's the lady that Yeah, I, uh, anatomy obviously is especially, a big one. especially if you're doing girls. Right. Especially. Yeah. Well, and just as an interesting thing in comics, so when I first started in comics, there was almost no titles uh, other than Lady Death and a few others that were female-driven, right? So everything that everybody bought was male characters, and the sort of exception was Wonder Woman. And even, like, you know, people didn't want to necessarily admit they collected Wonder Woman. In the last 20 years, you've seen this giant shift that if you weren't one of the big mainstay male characters, it has literally shifted over to... A lot of your popular characters, if you look at all the titles that people like us are doing as our own thing, usually you'll see that they're female characters. Um, but I would say one of the other things that I see uh, that I think is a problem is is everybody does either too much of one style and it's the sort of static, you know, sort of headshot. They can't do this dynamic flowing figure that maybe the camera angle changes. Yeah, like, and all yeah that. like a low up angle or a sword coming out. These are much more advanced things that are hard to do. And I see a lot of the, the work when I walk through Artist Alley today. I mean, oftentimes I'm not always inspired as I'd like to be because I see too much of the same thing. And I walk around and go, wow, you know, in some ways the bar is actually lower than it used to be yeah, because there's, it's a bigger world and it's more competitive. So there's people who are still getting to show their wares, which is great. But then I'm also hoping that makes them want to up their game. Right, because we're all we're all competing for some of the same dollars and things like that. So I'd like to see people just push themselves harder, the novices, and say, don't be satisfied with what you're doing here. You're you're showing us this early work. Maybe you should have waited a year or two and then shown even better work. Because you can never unshow your first work. And even when I show some of my early work, it absolutely falls into that category of even though people are like, wow, this is so cool, it's early Monty Moore work, and I'm like, yeah, why'd you have to put that on? <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. Publicly? Yeah, so, yeah. It burned all my But I'm painting now for Lady yeah. Death is very different than Helena or Lord's Number One, where I was the airbrush colorist for the, the book, and it, it absolutely falls into the, the category of, here's all these pitfalls of what we did, you know, people, everybody's kind of standing there like this. You know? <laughs> yeah, you have a good point, like, yeah, try, try, to, try to break the mold. You know, if you see, study what you, for cover art specifically, to see what's going on right now, because like we were talking earlier about the big feet and so on, trends in the styles, there's trends in how comic books are, are put out, even interior art. Right now we see, if you look at interior art on comic books, the panel pages are different than they were in the 90s. They're mm -hmm. not they're not quite as dynamic as they used to be. And that's just the trend right now, and it's fine, it works. It tells the story cohesively. Uh, same thing with covers, you, you'll see you'll see trends in the covers of. Especially when you get to like these pinup covers, um, especially with the stuff that I do with like Zenoscope and so on and so forth. Um, not to say there's a formula in place, but there's a, a you say on brand going on there, mm -hmm. and it's working right now. But if you can be that guy who's really good, who's new, and can come in and you know break that norm, you know you get recognized for that, and then you know you take the lead and you run with it. Well, so, and a fresh style will get you noticed, and so yeah. what I always tell people is. 
you know, don't draw just like Jim Lee, even if he's yeah. really good. Don't draw just like me or just like Mike or just like somebody else. But take things that you like from our style, integrate that into your own, whether that's a, a stylistic choice for anatomy or how to draw eyes. And I, even in my remarks and things like that, you'll see me doing different stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to draw the eyes bigger. They're going to be almond shapes. They're going to be cranked a little bit. And then I'm going to draw a straight one. And then I'm going to draw. And I try all these different things so that it's not always the same. And so I'm always trying to be better as an artist. And I'd like to see my suggestion for art, you know, art, artists out there who want to maybe do what we're doing, or just a hobby. Take the best of what you like from some yeah. of your favorite artists and try to integrate that, but make it your own. Yeah, I've always said hold yourself up to the brightest flame, you know, in your opinion, and you know, work yourself off of yep. that. Yep. Everybody's got their own standards and their own, you know, this that, that. Like, so whoever you think are like your top five people, you know, yeah, like Monty's saying, yeah. pull from them. Don't emulate them. Yeah. But use Campbell's eyes, Monty's lips, you know, whatever. Yeah. I was a D and D nerd. I still am. And so I can remember back in the day asking for a subscription to Dragon Magazine. And even though I played D and D, I hardly ever read anything. We hardly ever played the modules, but I wanted it for the art. Yeah, man. And the sort of four horsemen yeah. of the the early gaming art stuff was Keith Parkinson, Larry Elmore, uh, Clyde Caldwell. All these guys, they were they were my art heroes, and they still are. So that was who I aspired to be, and now to be in a lot of the same products and be friends yeah, with them as well is serious full circle nerd moment. <laughs> <laughs> If you had to pick a, a comic book from, uh, you kind of mentioned some inspirations for you. If you had to pick a comic book that you've seen that has really inspired your work, an, an image, what would that be? Like, I know that's a kind of a, a rough, that's a, a yeah, Sophie's yeah. Choice kind of question. Maybe pick Are you talking about one. art or the actual character? I would say the art. Like a cover that's really like inspired you that you've thought. Actually, one of, one, of them, one of them is actually in here, and it's that uh, art germ piece right there in the corner. Yeah, um, and I've seen several others since then. And even though that is a, it's a digital piece, it has a lot of um, finer elements to it. And it's gonna be the next one, Jimmy Amber, in the far corner. Yeah. What? Yep. Yeah, this one, Archer. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and I would say a couple of the other pieces that I've seen that kind of blew me away and make me want to be a better artist is Sun K. And they're they're painterly enough, although I think they're done digitally. I'm not sure, but when you if you're good enough at it and you can sort of fool the eye, and maybe they're maybe they're paintings, but they're really well done. And and even as an artist who has a great supporting uh, support from the the beans. It makes me want to think, man, I better up my game or I'm not going to get to ask at all. <laughs> right. Kevin yeah. Ryan doesn't call me anymore. <laughs> and so, yeah, you find out your old news when it's too late. Right, yeah. yeah. And so uh, there's a number of artists. Uh, even Frank Joe, I like his work a lot because his traditional artwork, he does these crazy ballpoint pen illustrations. And he can do folds and clothing that harkens back to like, 1800s inkers like Booth, Franklin Booth, and some of these other guys that are just ridiculous. And there's a classic way that if I'm doing folds or something, I may go out to the internet and be like, Frank Cho, you know, classic artwork. And I'll, I'll look at it for a few minutes and I'll kind of say, oh, what am I doing wrong? What am I missing? Because I'm drawing it all straight. And I'm like, yeah, I need some of this, some of that. And you break it down and you take inspiration from those. So. Yeah. Those are a couple of ones that, that I kind of look up to and aspire to integrate some of their badassness into what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get more into design lately. Uh, so I was just talking to somebody outside about this. The, the, the uh, Greg Poole era spawn covers were all amazing, every single one of them. Um, the design, even if they were super simple, the design that he did on those covers, the layouts, the composition, so on and so forth, yeah. they're all incredible. So that's what I've been trying to focus more on with my work now because that's what I feel like I've peaked with anatomy and all that other stuff, I just feel like I haven't put enough of an em emphasis on design. Um, but also, I'll, I'll drop his name again, Jay Anzaletto. Like, I'm amazed with what that guy's doing right now. Mm -hmm. I love his work colored, but I love going through, through his Instagram and looking at his pencils. Black, black and white, uh, super shaded. So good, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, the, I like the dynamics in his, his, in his covers right now, like the way he does, um, the, what we were talking about, the foreshortening and turning the figure and the camera around, and not just doing the straight up and down, you know, you My arm's hurt? coming at you. I got foreshortening, kind of shortcut. Yeah, you'll you know? see these covers these guys draw, and it'll be, you know, Nightwing going through and has the entire city in the background. I'm looking at it going, how in the hell did they right. draw that? Because exactly. it looks yeah. perfect yeah. from the perspective that they're at. 
And somebody like me, who's usually more tied to realism, I'm like, where's the reference shot? And I get the fact that you could do the city in the background and it's a drone or helicopter shot, helpful for foreshortening, or you just do your own with two-point perspective, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, I really applaud the guys who do dynamic action and dynamic angles, yeah. because that's a weakness of mine. Me too. Yeah. yeah. So when you, when you use the term design, can you define what you mean by that when you say, oh, I have to work on my design of a cover? How is that different than working on the anatomy? It's about leading the viewer's eye through the image partly. Um, I guess how yeah. I describe it, right? Yeah, yeah composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah composition. It's, it's kind design. of the yeah. design yeah. aspect. So whether that's... It's placing shapes in a certain order that looks balanced and pleasing to the eye and subconsciously pulls the viewer's eye through the entire image in almost like a repetitious circular motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's what design boils down to. And, you know, sometimes if I'm looking at, uh, you know, I keep folders of different sort of poses and things like that, and I might have one that just says seated poses, because maybe I want to do a throne piece or something like that. Sometimes you even look at the reference, even though it's a real photo, and you go, that won't work in art. Yeah. So whether it's the way the legs cross or something like that, that ends up two lines come together and they make a weird tangent, or one disappears behind the other, and you're like, oh, that's cool. And then you go, no, that's not going to work. But then you might see just the top part of that and say, what if I took the top part of this, but then I crossed her legs, and then well, what if the sword's across that? And a lot of times for me, it's like pieces of the puzzle. And I just start out with one, and then I kind of build around it. And three or four hours later, even if I don't even have much of a sketch, it's evolved. And suddenly there's the bear, and there's the ivy, and there's these other elements. And you put it all together, and you go, ooh. That's going to be freaking cool. Yeah, I'm going to stop all this other stuff and draw that. Sometimes you just know. <laughs> yeah. So composition plays a big point. And it I does. think a lot of, I think there's fewer people now that are maybe studying that because they're going right to like digital classes and yeah. everything is online and that sort of thing. And they're maybe not spending as much time on the fundamentals as we call it. Which which which, which bad design can make any image, especially a cover, fall apart. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could be the best illustrator in the world. You could have perfect anatomy, cool dynamics, all that stuff, but if your composition sucks, it, most of your shit's going to fall apart. Yeah. You know, if, you, if it's not if it's not balanced and so on and so forth. Like, I, I'm friends with a graphic designer right now. That's who I'm tutoring, and she's teaching me a lot about design and balance with her graphic design background. She's like, oh, this is hierarchy and so on and so forth, and she's throwing terms at me that I've never heard before. You know, like, I never thought about hierarchy. I guess you're right. I guess I could put that into this. It should have an effect, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and with the digital coloring today, too, there's there's a lot of colors who are so good. Yeah. They are just saving the bacon of a piece that can kind of be ho-hum. Yeah. And you, you might look at it and go, eh, not the greatest pencils I've seen. And then you give it to, like, one of the top three or four, like, coffin colorists, Ula Moss, CC, Sanju, yeah. uh, Sabine. Any of these, and then you see back the finished piece, and you're like, "Holy crap! That, Sanders, that's amazing!" I'll, I'll say that record. Sanju saved my butt so many times over the last <laughs> ten years. Like, you know, I didn't ask. He's just doing his thing, and that's how good he is at what he does. He's just like I, I had to phone it, you know, I ran out of time, or I, but like you were saying earlier, like somebody just gets in your way, the piece doesn't come out as well as you want it to. Sanju sometimes comes in, and goes, you know, he splashes a little magic on there and to sell the cover. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, alrighty then, he's on the Christmas list. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to fly up to and shake his hand. So thanks, Jan. Thank you, man. You saved me a lot. Yeah. It, it seemed like you were kind of going into some of the challenges that you face, like you're running out of time or whatever the case. Can you think of a, a particular coffin cover or any cover, really, that, that has posed a really big challenge and that was a difficult hurdle for you mm -hmm. to come over? Uh, you go first, I have to think. Yeah, I got to think, too. Right? There, there, there have been a couple because I always want to make Brian happy. Um, Brian's always been really good to his artists, and uh, since day one with Brian, he's always been um, above and beyond and always an exceptional guy. So when it comes to Brian, I try to put more thought and more effort into things. So there have been several times where I'm like, that's not good enough, that's not good enough. You know, I won't even show it to Brian until I think it's good enough. Um, so I'm with Monty. I gotta sit here and think one particular who's been a lot. But what was the hurdle when you said that's not good enough? What was it that made it? Not, I, I don't know. This is very organic. Yeah, you're right. right. Picture, so it's kind of hard to to differentiate. But what was it that was the hurdle? What made it not good enough? Oh man, that's a good question. How do you explain that? Um, my own intuition as an, an illustrator. Like a lot of times, I trust my own artistic direction over somebody who's art directing me. 
Um, not every single time, but a lot of times I go into that way and I say, I'll, I'll be drawing and sketching something out and I say, that doesn't look good to me. That's probably not going to look good to anybody. Maybe I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It doesn't look to, look good to me. I don't want to submit it to my editor and get, have him give it to green right. and white. And then, you know, a piece comes out. It. <laughs> right, I'm stuck with it. So to say exactly what it is that seems to fall out of place, it's, it's hard to answer because it's all subjective to the individual piece itself. Right. Everything's a little different. It could be the pose. It could be something as simple as the way the hair is flowing in a thumbnail layout, you know. Um, so many things come into play. But there has been, I'll say specifically, a lot of coffin covers that have been challenging just because I want to bring the A game every single time. And it's never because Brian is getting in the way or anybody else on the team is getting in the way. I'm getting in my own way, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm, I can't think of, there's been so many Lady Death covers that I've done, I can't remember all of them. So that's part of the challenge too. Do you have any in mind on it? Uh, uh, there, there was something that challenged you? There was a, uh, there's been one or two times, and this is kind of an ongoing issue sometimes if I'm drawing so fast and I'm not paying attention to kind of the level of the eyes and or the size. So there's been a couple of pieces where even in the prelim or the finished piece where I've actually needed to go back and then I go, what do you mean the eyes are off? And you look at it and go, oh my God, those are really, you know, and one will be slightly higher than the other and <laughs> one's kind of cocked, and, you know, and it's doing this weird thing and he gets it right away. Yeah. And then there was another one that was an early cover where unfortunately it was the same thing, but it was with the breasts. And so he, he, kind of, he kind of did like a, here's what this one's doing and here's what this one's doing. And because I had already done it in Photoshop uh, or I had done the painting and it needed to be the deadline was like that day. Basically what I needed to do was sort of like clone the section and then just sort of warp and shape and adjust and then just do a little digital smoothing. And I'm confident enough. I have a Cintiq and a stylus and all those nifty things that I could do that in a matter of minutes a lot quicker than I could do it and change the entire painting. And so there are times when my anatomy is slightly off and I'm either a little too cavalier or fast with it and I'm not just staring going, is this anatomically right? Because the thing you have to remember too is, is depending on what the character's doing, if she's doing this, everything else is moving. Yeah, and so people, people will say, oh, that doesn't look right. And you're like, her arm's over her head. One is going to be higher than the other is pulled backers. That's what anatomy does. But in comics, a lot of times we forgive that. Mm -hmm. And we just go, yeah, that looks weird when I draw it for real. So you try to find a happy balance between comic book, which is fantasy world, <clears throat> and the real world, but still making the anatomy work. Yeah. So there's been a few times where I've had anatomy problems that I get that other people have pointed out. And one of my friends, Matt Haley, who's an artist, is like, man, you always got a problem with the eyes. And it's true. Sometimes I look back at early work on my sketchbooks, and I'm like, those eyes are wrong, that eye's off. And they won't be looking in the perfect direction because I just drew them so fast. And when somebody points that out later on, you're like, well, I better pay a little more attention. And every so often I'll post something online and they'll go like, you got the eyes right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thanks, Matt. <laughs> so I'd like to maybe look into our online viewers if there's any shout outs or questions yep. for our two artists here. And just heads up, we've got six more minutes here. So before we're up. You guys know where our babies come from? <laughs> we have the answer. So, so okay, from wow. Demon Phil, how that much? <laughs> so, how much character research do you do to accomplish the level of covers you produce? So I guess for a different um, the character. Research. For me, not 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 a whole lot for myself. I've been working with the same companies for a long time. Enough to say, I know their characters very very well, but I know them well enough. I have an idea of who they are enough to 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 pull it off. It's just, it's it's always difficult when they bring in a new character. And like the book hasn't been drawn yet, and you're like, oh, this is my character or whatever, you know, Shiva, and uh, you know, you're the first guy to draw. I needed a designer. Like that's when it gets tough. Right, and if it ends up looking like Sheena, and they go, you said it looks like Jungle Girl, and they're like, yeah, but that looks too yeah, much like right. Jungle yeah, Girl. Yeah, that's I'm like, all well, that happens all the time. But how yes. is it different than Jungle Girl? Like, well, she doesn't have a spear. Right. I'm like, oh, right. Okay, well, just tell me that in the beginning, so I can say, well, do you want her swinging on a vine, or do you, you know, could she have something else? And so you want to ask those basic questions do, that yeah. occur. Um, but I'm doing a cover for Brian right now for La Muerta. And I have drawn La Muerta before, but not in this particular outfit. So in the assignment, it makes it easy for me. Brian says, here's the deadline. Here's what I'd like. And he'll have a concept uh, in mind. And it could be a piece of reference from anything from a Molly Hatchet cover, right? That was like Frazetta or something, to something else that says, I like these three figures like this. 
I need these three like this, like general placement, not you know where the hands are. But then he'll include, here's the reference, here's the deadline, here's it, go nuts. And so there's very little art direction, but there's enough that you're not going in the right direction. If he says, here's the setting, you know, it's a graveyard, it's a train station, here's the characters that are in it, they're doing this. It needs to tell a visual story, but I think we all like it when there's a uh, shove in the right direction, but it's not so constricted. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Leave a, little, a few breadcrumbs for us to follow. And There's been a few guys I've done commissions yeah. for, and they'll send three page descriptions. Oh, and that. usually, you just, you know, when you're earlier in your career, you don't say no to anything. And yeah. then later on, you're like, you know what? This is uh, probably not the right guy for this. Unless you can just visualize as you're reading it and go, oh, I got that. Mm -hmm. Then you're fine. But it's a lot of times it's really hard to please that particular client or customer when it's so constrictive mm -hmm. that they're like, no, no, no. I told you that they were touching shoulders. You're like, yeah, <laughs> but they're just like two inches apart. No, no. They need to be touching <laughs> shoulders. You're like, oh. There is that guy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so how long do you give yourself when you, you do a cover? Is there like a standard time? I, do you guys I, I, always, I always give myself more time than I need and then actually work on it for too short a period of time. I always give myself about four days because I can knock out something really good in four days. I know that and work at my own pace. But I'm an artist. I don't work four days in a row. So I do. <laughs> do you really? Oh yeah. yeah. I'm so bad about it sometimes. Really, I, I can get a, a good cover done in two days. I could. Um, that's usually what I give myself. I work well under under pressure. I learned that when I was going to school. Um, that if I don't have pressure on me, I can't sit still. I have the attention span of a housefly, <laughs> so I give myself four days and I actually work three to two, two to three days. And like, it, it, is there a certain hour that you do during those days? All or is it just... day. Uh, yeah, it's my schedule is so crazy. Uh, no, I, I get up, I take my kids to school, I come home back around like nine o'clock in the mor in morning, and then I work all day on and off until I just can't stay awake anymore. And that, that's what works for me. I've tried to be more rigid with my schedule. I've tried to be more disciplined in all that and be more structured. And it doesn't work for me. I am a creature of chaos. <laughs> yeah. I and I think uh, from what I've talked to, most artists that I know are nocturnal. You know, yeah. we're all Batman. And, you know, people will message me like, dude, you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I just stepped away from the art table. You know, and sometimes it just has to do with your workload. Yeah. I mean, I would love it if I had perfect work-life balance, but I also don't want to say no to jobs. I can be higher output, and I, I don't have kids, so I don't have that uh, particular obligation. And so I can say, hey, I'm going to work an extra four hours tonight. And I would say most of my covers take between 25 and 40 hours. And sometimes if I have to drop the hammer, I can do that in two and a half, four days because I often work 15 hours a day and I won't stop working until then. And I, from the time I get up, you know, unless I go to the gym or something, I'm probably working. Doesn't mean I'm doing art, but it could be marketing email. I do. I did hire somebody this year to actually yeah, help that, that. That's where I, <laughs> not to get off subject, that's where I fall recently. It's like, yeah, I, that's to answer part of your question. I, yeah, because one third of my day is just correspondence with, you know, different kinds of editors yeah, and people. Shipping. And you know, I, I really like to keep in touch with my followers, you know. Yeah. Not necessarily one on one all the time, but if I post something I like to respond. Yep. So that's I consider that working, even if it's it is. it's marketing. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why you're successful. I think so, because I don't draw that well. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to get from <laughs> So we got two minutes left. Uh, here's one last question from Haley. Do you guys each have your, your favorite cover that you've ever done? Uh, uh mind that you uh, it's it's like choosing your favorite kid. I say I did a cover for Grim Fairy Tales number 61 back in 2010, and as far as I know, it's the first topless cover outside of like the porn industry comic books to hit you know San Diego Comic Con. And then what year I, was it? Two, I want to say it was 2010. Grim Fairy Tales number 61 was in the scope. Me and Evas did two topless covers, and before that we were all doing you know the teaser stuff, and that's when we dropped the first topless one. And after that, then it's like chaos ensued. Oh, but I was just yeah, really yeah. happy with that how that cover illustration came out at the time, uh, despite the fact that it was topless or not, it just happened to be. But and the fact that it has that benchmark attached to it, uh, it's, it's cool to me. Yeah, I wonder if that kind of changed the industry. And like I said, I, I, as far as my knowledge goes, I could be wrong, but as far as I, my knowledge goes, there's a lot of teaser stuff through Top Cow and all those guys and the J Company was doing really risque uh, variants, right. but none of them were topless yet. Okay, I until, can see that. Yeah, it was like, I think it was 2010. 
I think one of the first ones I did was a penny for your soul, and then it, it was, you know, Nadia and Nice and mm -hmm. some Zenoscope and stuff, but I don't remember if any of the Zenoscope ones I did were. If it was before 2000, uh, I'd say 10, no. I don't think so. I think yeah. this was more like 14 or 15. So okay. I think it was a couple of years after. At that, that point, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely some favorites within uh, uh, the Lady Death realm. Uh, and some I like better than others, but I guess honestly, the one I'm most excited about is whatever the next one is. Yeah, that's true. Because that's what gets me fired up. I mean, I've got two or three covers that I'm working on for Brian, and I'm anxious to actually start them. And that means I know that I'm not burnt out as an artist because I'm like, man, I can't wait to reveal and show this and see it successful. And I love selling original art. So uh, even almost 30 years into the industry, I still love being a commercial artist. Yeah, so. me too. It's always something to move forward. All right, so I'd like to take this moment to thank our cover artists here for their time and insights. And I'd like to thank those who tuned in and, and with their great questions. Uh, stay tuned for more Coffin Comic Con Madness. We'll be back at five. All right, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, that was good. Nice.